It was a beautiful Tuesday morning. There was no clouds in the sky. It was as blue as it could be. I was on my roof, putting a, on my house top, putting a new roof on. The people in New York were wondering about thousands of them were going to the financial district there in Wall Street, not Wall Street, but the, the trade center there. And I guess when you have that type of weather, you feel good. And you can just imagine all the conversations going on because the weather makes you feel better when it's like that type of a day at once. And they're on their way to work to the, to the trade towers. But then they know that in a few minutes, they're going to be dead. When I first saw that, when I first saw those buildings falling down, I said, oh my goodness, 50,000 people are dead. I had no idea. I don't know how those farmers did it, but they did it. They got them. I don't know if that 200,000 really only died, but they got them out of there. And I don't really understand how they did it. I meant to bring a magazine today that I had picked up in Panama City Beach right after that and had pictures of people, I had pictures. You may have saw it, I don't know if you've seen it or not. And uh, it showed people jumping out out of the windows. They, whoever took those pictures got right up close and saw them. You almost had expressions on their face. I was going to bring it on what I did with it. But, that day, September 11th, is a day that none of us will ever forget. Everybody knows where they were when I was on my roof. And I didn't even bother to come down when Dale came out and said, well, a, a, fly, a plane flew in the World Trade Center. I was going about my business. And she came out a few minutes later and said, another one. I still didn't come down. Then she said, another one. I still didn't come down. Well, I said, I was sitting on it. Well, there's been a lot of them. The only reason I come down because the heat now was getting on the shingles and you were starting to mess the shingles up. I had to get down, come down, and then I saw that. And I saw the planes flying into the, into the building, and I felt so sorry for these people. I don't know if they knew what was coming or not, because, you know, you don't have front view windows, you have side view windows, and they, they, they could see where they were. I don't know if they knew they were going to be dead. That's the best thing about that. If there's anything good about it, they got into it. They didn't have time to think about it. I guess they thought they were going to be getting out and land somewhere, and what are they going to do? The thing is, what do we remember about that day? And more importantly, what do we learn? What do we learn? I remember when I was at the feast down in Panama City and I was talking to another brother and I said, just give a matter of time and this will all be just a fade memory. And he did. That's what it's become. In fact, Kay came out with a sermon not too long ago before he died. It says, business as usual. And that's exactly what has happened. Business as usual. The flags. No longer fly like they used to. People probably stopped going to churches and all this stuff. They, they did, you know, after that. And so, that's probably all ceased to right back into the same old things they did before. But on Tuesday morning, September 11, 2011, at 8.45 a.m., the face of the nation has been permanently changed. And we're still fighting that same day. This was six years later. We're still dealing with it. And it's going to be good. This may be what leads all the way up to the Middle East war and the downfall of the United States. I don't know. We just have to wait and see who the next president is, who we're really going to come to. But that time, American Flight 11, Boeing 767, bound to Los Angeles, slammed probably 500 miles an hour into the Trade Center, the North Tower Trade Center. 18 minutes later, United Airlines 175, and that's also another the Boeing 647, 6, 767. In route to Los Angeles with 51 passengers and nine crew, approached the other trade building and he hit. He saw that. Later, a little later that, there's another plane. See what it was. It was a 943 American Airlines 77, a Boeing 757 traveling 345 miles an hour, slammed into the Pentagon, killing close to 400 people. I used to work above the Pentagon there. Just cut Great big building called the Naval Annex, and I can look down and see the Pentagon from where I worked at. I probably looked at the very side where that plane hit it. I, we were going to go back this, this past spring to Washington. I always wanted to go back, but we did, and something came up, and uh, we went to Myrtle Beach instead. I always wanted to go back up there. So I said, most of them recall where they were. I was on the roof, fixing, on the house, fixing the roof. But as you all know, you were stunned. I was stunned. The entire world was stunned to see what was unfolding right before their very eyes. In fact, there's a movie on HBO right now called, I think it's called Hamas Sale. I'm not sure if the Hamas is right. But it's dealing with these, these Arabs. 
because these Muslims are going to put that back under the work. As they, for, for the next two, three years, preparing to do what they did on 9 11. They were in the United States trying to get visas, trying to learn how to fly, and some of the raw things they went through. And one of them asked this, this girl, asked this guy who's going to be one of the jihadists, said, If you love me, then why are you going to die in two years? See, it doesn't make sense, does it? He couldn't answer her. And another Arab said, What's people done to you? Why do you want to do this for? You know, nobody's done anything wrong with you. You're not doing this for other people, other areas we're just talking about. You're doing this for yourself. This is one air telling another. This is in the movie. I didn't watch all the movies because I just got tired of it. But it's really interesting to see these things unfold. I don't know how angry it is, but it did unfold. But one of the things you can remember seeing is they show pictures of the Arab world, Arab around the world, had they jumped up and glee and clapping and going on this. They were so elated. So many people were killed. And the truth be not, the millions of Arabs in this country who are living in their freedom, do whatever they want, stood up and cheered also. I, I, I think they did that, especially in German Michigan, which is probably millions of them who live in German today, cheered that downfall. This day has been characterized as the worst in history. It's worse than Pearl Harbor. It's worse than the Oklahoma City bombing just a few years ago. It's worse than the space shuttle challenge that exploded. It's worse than all of those things put together. The, the questions are very simple. How could this act happen? And what could be done to prevent it? You know, we sing a song here. Uh, you may not forget, know this, but we sing, unless the Lord should build a house. It's taken from Psalms 127, verse 1. This is what it says. Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. And listen to this. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. So in other words, New York City, they watched in vain. Because God's protection over New York City was not there, was it? If it was, then this would not be allowed to happen. So why did it happen? Why did it happen? Why did God choose to allow this to occur? Um, oh, no. <laughs> Why did God allow this to happen? It's 9-11. It's 9-11 at the beginning of a series of calamities that will cripple the greatest nation in history. And will it escalate to a point where human survival will be threatened. That's what I mean. This war in Iraq, as you can see, is not going to let up. There is no limit to how long these Muslims fight. It's like the ones in Vietnam when I was there in Vietnam. We use the word struggle. They use the word struggle. We use the word struggle to a certain point where we get tired of struggle and we quit and go home. The Vietnamese didn't do that. They struggle and struggle until they want. That's how the Muslims work. They're going to struggle and struggle and fight and kill until Jesus Christ will stop them. That's how they're going to do it. So this war in Iraq is going to escalate. It's not going to die down. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. And there's going to be calamities that's going to happen to this war, in this war, in our nation that's going to cripple us. And you might be seeing the beginning of these gas pumps right now. I don't have people to afford this. Gail said she filled up in Barberville at the Chiefs that you can find. It cost her $30 just for half a tank. I've got a 30 gallon tank on my trunk. You can imagine what it's going to cost me close to $100 because I can't do that. And no one can do that unless you make a good salary. How does God not see evil? And how will you correct, correct the world that is driven by hate? How's he going to do that? Revelation 19, chapter verse 15. Revelation 19, chapter 15. This is how God's going to do that. He says, that out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he will smite the nations, and he will tread the mind press of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. That's how he's going to stop this. He has to. Spanking a child sometimes doesn't work, does it? And there's some children out there, you can spank and spank and spank and you will not do them any good. They just love it. And some nations just love to be spanked. But how does the Bible describe the end time? Does the Bible speak about the great destruction that's coming? 
such as experience on 9 11, or such talk sent to a product of doomsday religious fanatics. Is that what I'm doing? Is that what the Armstrongs did for, since the 30s? A doomsday fanatic, predict, predict, uh, predicting the end of the world. Well, no. The, the Bible speaks of a time that a great stress will come upon this earth and is called the day of the Lord as well as the day of God's wrath and represents the last of man's rule on this earth. This is why that people who can come to services and do not hear what I'm going to talk about today, they're going to miss it. And I think we're going to make a decision somewhere very soon that people who are part of this organization, I was talking to Mr. Trent about this other day, that receive tapes from us to hear these sermons and we give it out. The thing about stop it. Because they're, they're staying home. They're not making any effort to come here. And I'm not going to simply waste my time doing this. Let them sit there on the couch and do nothing. But be a part of the work. I'm going to go through some things here that deals with what God thinks about people like this. I said, I'm not talking about you because you're a very loyal and very faithful servant here. We're going to look at things that what God's going to do to people is not take this serious. This is a very, like I said last week, this is the most important work on the face of this earth. And not to want to be a part of it, just to want to sit back and do nothing, let everybody else do the work. That doesn't please God at all. Not one bit, we should see. Mankind will finally experience firsthand just how serious God is about being defiant to his law. And just go, look at Joel 2, the second chapter. Joel, the second chapter, verse 11, I'm sorry. Joel, the second chapter, verse 11. And the Lord was, shall utter his voice before his army, for he is, for he is strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who, who can abide it? Who can abide it? Joel was, the only, was not the only person described the day of the Lord. The apostle John wrote this way. Revelation 6, chapter, verse 17. Revelation 6, if I go into five, just let me know. Because I've already got them written out, so I can read them. I can read the part from that time. Before. Revelation 6, chapter, verse 17. This is the apostle John. For well, the great day of his wrath come, who shall be able to stand? We just, you can read these things that are coming on this earth that God's going to do for this earth. And you can understand why he's going to do what he's going to do. He has, that's, he has no choice. And so it's mind-boggling that things are going to take place. In fact, I can't even visualize things that are going to take place on this earth. Who gets wrath because of our total disobedience to him. If the world is in disobedience to him, what about those who know the truth and refuse to do it? What category do they fall in? John goes on to describe how during this time, even the mightiest men, will be consumed with fear. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how mean you are. People who play football, you've got to have a mean streak in you to play that game. Or violent people such as Osama bin Laden, all these violent people, all these people who think they're so great and so mean and so tough, we're going to see just, this is how God describes them. John, Revelation 6, chapter, verse 15. Revelation 6, chapter, beginning verse 15. John writes, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, those who think they're so powerful, so strong, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and to the rocks, follow us and hide us from the face of the who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. How do they know that? How do they know that's who that is? Because they've been told for about 50 years. And it's finally going to dawn on these people through what, I don't care what these people think about the arms. I don't care what they think about their personal life, anything like that. What they got on the television and on the radio and told them the prophecies about the coming kingdom of God. And all that's going to entail is the truth. And it's going to stick in their minds, those who are alive. And they're going to remember how so they know that this is the land of God. This ain't heard it before. They're going to know. Isaiah 2, verse 19. <clears throat> Isaiah 2, verse 19. They shall go forth into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth. From terror, O Lord, and from the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake the earth and For those people who are staying home, 
for those people who don't want to be a part of this, for those people who just want to criticize, criticize the ministry and make fun of us because we're dressed to please Herbert Armstrong. You're be pleased with the way you're dressed. For those people who want to sit there and do nothing, shame on you. This is the greatest work. Maybe you're the one that's going to be screaming and hiding in cliffs of the rocks and house from the face of the land because we didn't do what we're supposed to be doing. This earth, during this period of time, will be filled with such terror that men will seek death and not even be able to find it. You read that Revelation in the 9th chapter, verse 6, I don't turn there. They will want to die. And God and death is going to be denied. not going to let them to die. I don't know what the problem is here. Maybe some chemical things or something like that. And uh, they're going to suffer. They're going to suffer. Now, there is a I've often, I've read some of the old literature of Herbert Rawls um, you know, talking about, you know, he believed in the, the lay of the sea and the air of the scenes, and they were going to go through the tribulation. And uh, I don't know if I believe that or not when that was came out. I know today I don't believe that. I don't believe the church, those who are lackluster, those who are, not, who are complacent, those who are not on fires of the word of God, I don't believe they're going to allow, God's going to allow these to go through the tribulation. When you read that, when you read what it says, who are these that come out of the great tribulation? What did it say? These are those who have cleaned their robes. Now they've got a white, clean linen. That means they've repented. Well, when did that happen to you? When you were baptized. So what? Well, I understand what he was saying. You can take off the rope, put on the dirty robes, go out to whatever you want to, go through the tribulation, repent, come out with clean robes back. I don't believe that one bit. If you don't make it through this first time, you're not going to make it through the tribulation. He's not going to allow you to put on clean robes and take it off, put them on and take it off. You're going to put it on and keep it on. That's what the days that are left are all about. Keeping that white, clean robe on. And so those who do not want to be a part of this, those who want to criticize, well, we'll see what's going to happen to you in just a few minutes. Zephaniah, the first chapter, verse 14. Zephaniah, the first chapter, in verse 14. It says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near, and hasteth great. Even the voices of the day of the Lord, and the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. I guess the best way to describe it is for a man to be in labor. And I don't know what that's like. I've seen the expressions on Gail's face. I've seen the expressions on my daughter's face, given birth, and it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. The pain on their faces was not fun. So the pains of many who think they're so tough, I can take anything. They're going to weep bitterly like a little baby. Unless you have that protection of God Almighty, no one on this earth will be able to escape. You just read it. You just mentioned all of it. If you don't have God's protection, you have no place to, there's no place to hide. Nor will mankind be able to buy his way out of this stress that's coming to this earth. They will throw their silver and gold in the streets. And it's useless to them. It's absolutely useless to them. They can't buy their way out of this one. You know, this is time for God. It's right. Let me read it. Zephaniah. Turn it right quickly. There it is. Zephaniah, the first chapter, verse 18. Neither shall their, neither their gold, nor neither silver nor gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of God's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he who makes speedy riddance of those who dwell in this land. Why is he going to do that? Why is God so angry? I'm sitting right now, I'm looking down at that little thing, and it shut off. I'm telling you, modern technology, my mind's still back to the stone ages. I just can't get that thing to work at all. Now, so you can't buy your way out of what's coming. The only way to go, the only thing God wants from us is obedience. Is just follow the instructions. Follow the instructions. They're so simple. Repent, be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The people simply don't want to be repent. They like their lifestyle. If you're rich, you're going to love your lifestyle. Aren't you? You've got the modern cars, you've got all the little gadgets, you've got the nice homes, the nice clothes, and you need the restaurant you want. And uh, do whatever you want, go any place you want to go. You got it, 
You got it made. So they're not going to repent. They're not going to repent of that last. So I'm anxious to see it. I'm going to watch it. I don't forget it. Jerry Falwell's funeral. They haven't had it. I thought they were buried in there. They don't get buried till Monday. This is going to be televised. If you get Sky Angel, this is going to be on Sky Angel. And so I'm going to, I know what they're going to say. Well, that jury's going off to be with the Lord. And uh, just see what they have to say about it. Because I thought he was a very selfish individual person. And I'll tell you why. Uh, he did not want the kingdom of God on this earth per se. What he wanted, I heard him say, I want to live to be at least up in my 80s. So the college he has over there can have at least 50,000 students on campus, another 50,000 students taking uh, correspondence courses, plus build other buildings so we can get more people out and to uh, preach the word of Christ to the world. And I think that's a selfish attitude on his part because he didn't care about the rest of the world suffering. If he did, he didn't want the kingdom of the first. And that's not what he wanted. He wanted those buildings, and he wanted that campus and that college to grow. And that's all physical. I, 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 Isaiah describes the overwhelming strength of God's children on a world that is totally defiant of Him. Nobody says you just you just heard it all go. We read again Isaiah 66, beginning of verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with His chariots, like a whirlwind, to render His anger with fury, and He is rebuked with flames of fire. For by, by His sword. The Lord will judge all flesh, and the slain of the Lord will be many. Not just a few, many. Probably up to as many as uh, nine-tenths of the world population be dead. Do you ever hear anything like that on modern Protestantism? You don't hear anything like that. You don't hear any type of warning about that. Now, I'm telling you, I don't know where this will go, because anything will stop, I have to do it again, uh, that those who hear this, to know that nine tenths of the world population is going to be dead. Where does that put you at? Where does it put the church at? Where does it put the lackadaisical people in God's church at? We'll see. Now it's hard in this room to visualize the magnitude of God's justice. It's really very difficult to visualize that. What's coming? On a rebellious planet, but it's real and it's one kind. The eighth chapter. Uh, the book of Revelation tells this. This is how God's wrath is going to begin. It says there was silence in heaven for about the space of an hour. So it begins his wrath with silence. Now, I don't know why he's doing it. The only thing I can think about why he may be doing what he's there is no silence there. Maybe he's pondering over the fact what he's about to do. Hey, he's going to intervene in world affairs. Maybe that's what he's doing right there. He's pondering on these things. So he begins the wrath with silence. And then what? Just like on the day, that day, on September 11th, it was such a gorgeous day. It's beautiful. There's birds are singing. No one had a care in the world for the most part. Everybody was happy, especially here in the United States. And bam, sudden destruction came. And that's what it says about the tribulation. When they say peace and safety, and they're going to say that. Then peace and safety is gone. Just like the government declared 9 11, it came without warning. That's the title of the sermon. It came without warning. 9 11 came without warning. And that's what the day of the Lord is going to be. People don't expect the return of Jesus Christ the way we know he's going to come back. You know, you know what he's, how these modern preachers talk? He's going to come back in two phases. One to rapture the church away to avoid the tribulation. This makes no sense at all because you can't hurt a spirit being by raising the dead. Leave them there. But they come first, don't they? It says the dead rise first. Why raise the dead if they're going to avoid the tribulation? And then come back in the second phase to, I don't know what, to destroy the world? I don't know. I don't really listen all that close to them. But I do know this. Before the wrath begins, before God's wrath begins, there is silence in heaven. And you know, like I say, the only thing I can also think of is pondering and going over in his mouth exactly what he's about to do. That's all I can think of. He is going to use a lot of correction on the world buried in, buried in human filth and evil. 
That's what this world is consistent of, isn't it? Evil. I don't know how people say that. Every time we turn around, it seems like a woman has disappeared and her husband is accused of murder or just about some murder of the kids. Don't these people ever hear a thing called divorce? If you don't want to stay with your partner, divorce them. Instead of kill them. But that's what's happened. But it seems like it happens all the time. Now, you've got teachers and sexually molest the children. I just read on the internet last night. We go through the old details. We're out in the parking lot. Some teachers in grade school so have a, a, a sex party or something out in the parking lot. Little babies. And we were talking to Georgia today on the phone, and I, was, and I hadn't seen the Timmons' uh, website. I'm trying to link on it, I can't pull it up. And, and this was it COG. You, I forgot what it was. He says, I think what he told me he says, they thought that you can't get women without money or something like that. That's what they thought. So they changed their website, the Timmons did. I said, how would you even think something like that? Well, my mind don't work that way. When I look at the website, look what it says. You can't get women of that money. That's what went through their minds when they saw their website. So they, he said they changed it. So why, do, why does people think that way? Why do, one of the things that people don't understand, why do they think the way they think and how they come to think it? How they come to re realize and live their lives what they do? They don't know. They don't know there's a great God, or there's a the God of this world out there, an evil, powerful spirit being who influences the human mind. They make fun of that. We know that terrorism is the commonplace throughout the Middle East. And now it's circling the world. They just, I guess they're in a state right now just sort of picking their spots and times. You haven't heard too much about that here lately. Well, them blowing up in things. Don't be surprised what you hear coming. Evil has saturated in what many of the Western world calls contemporary morals. No one knows right from wrong. 40 million abortions have been formed in the U.S. alone. This practice is defended in the name of freedom. But how does God see it? How does God see it? Today in the United States alone, just the United States alone, people lie, they steal, they cheat with impunity. It's not just the secular world, but from the religious worlds, we find that they're mired in self-made filth. And many times we I don't know why I don't use them on tape. We know people with evangelists are all the time seem like they're getting caught aren't they? in an adultery situation and sometimes even a homosexual situation. Now we've got religious people who mess, mess little boys and get away with it. Now we want to let homosexuals into the ministry. I don't know what Bible they use when he talks about that. It is an abomination. It's a filthy sexual act that you shouldn't be done. It's says worthy of death. And yet they allow these men and women to get to preach in their homosexuals. You think that pleases God? No. Television evangelists are what they're called adulterous acts of prostitution. And even the members of their own congregation. It happens all the time, but all the time. And it even happened, it's happened in the church of God. Faith healers proclaiming Jesus is the Lord has been exposed in charlatans, scamming thousands of people. And searching desperate, and searching desperate for the hope. Of These people are searching desperate for the scam for hope, and they take money from them by the millions. I was just looking the other day at Fred Price, his mansion he lives in, out in California, and also uh, the one he gives. Jesus is Lord. Him and his wife Gloria, what's his name? Uh, out in Oklahoma, rides a motorcycle, uh, but he had a. Um, Imagine like 26 rooms, all the cars, and all this stuff. And all of them, I always tell them that we just all of them, this rich and buzz. Scamming people. It doesn't end there. And I, this is from the standpoint of God looking at the world. It doesn't end there. Governments, too, have failed to provide true leadership. He says, God says, if you don't obey me, the leaders I give you won't have enough wisdom to go to the bathroom by themselves. That's my put it this way. But they said they won't have the wisdom to guide you correctly because of the disobedience to me. Well, you can see, you know, they take payoffs. 
and yet they put other people in jail for doing the very same things. And all these lobbyists do it. They go up there and they, they court these senators and pay them off in order to get votes to vote their way to get their whatever law passed. That's just buying votes, isn't it? What's the difference? And we have this all the time. The court systems are all crazy. Look at O.J. Simpson. He got off of murder. At least you think he has it yet. He, I guess you saw at the Del the Derby Festival. The guy wouldn't serve him. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't let him eat there no more. He was his friend years ago. And people got up in the block. And so this is the world. This is the world that God loves in. A world full of evil. We're full of filth. Full of immorality. No one knows what's right. Full of re false religions, false gods, false stupidity way up there. I'll never know, and I cannot get it in my mind, how do you worship a cow? I don't understand what goes through a mind, a person's mind, who thinks a dumb animal is better than you. That don't make sense. Doesn't make a bit of sense. But how far will this world go before Jesus Christ can be? You all know what it says in Matthew 24, verses 37, 30, and 39. It talks about in the days of Noah. And it was always continuous evil in the days of Noah. And that day is going to be approaching us very soon. It's going to get much worse than the conditions you look at today. There's nothing to compare to what it's going to be. It's going to be so dangerous out there. That's what it says. And perilous times in the last the word perilous means dangerous times to be living on this earth. That's how bad it's going to get. As the days of Jesus Christ approach, you're going to see things get much worse before he stops it. Or puts an end to it. Brother, this is the world you and I live in. This is the world we must function in. That's why so many people who do not show up to these services, who can be here, shame on you. It's a shame on you. God has called you to be a part of this work, not to sit home and put on your robe and kick back in a recliner and throw in a seat that he has a sermon on, but you probably fall asleep halfway through in the first place. And never listen to the whole thing. If you do listen to it, you probably don't pay much attention to it. You probably don't know what you're about. You probably don't do anything. It's a shame of you for not wanting to be such a part of this work, the most important part in this world. This is the world we live with. All this technology, the life is filled with violence. With all its knowledge, it's filled with ignorance and superstitions. With all its wealth, it is filled with poverty. With all its laws, it's filled with filth and it's filled with crime. I used to, when I was a car carpenter, I had a KRS book exactly. And somebody involved broke into one of the cabins, had to look up the stupid law to see when I could apply it to it. Because you broke in with a gun, it's a different one. Or if, you, if the door is open, you, you broke in, you come out and you stole something with it, it's a different law. It's, it's stupid. All mean, you can't enforce the fact. There's no way. There's too many of them. So with all our swift and all our laws and all our judges, we still are a nation filled with crime. So we've got a big problem now. A humongous problem that we cannot solve. The only thing that you and I can do is what I'm doing right now and the rest of the ministry is lift up our voices like a trumpet. I'm trying to confirm people. Tell them the truth and let them do with it what they wish. Christ says it, and God says it, even if they don't want to hear it, it doesn't make any difference. You tell them any of it. You tell them any of it. a bunch of stiff-necked, hard-hearted Israelites. You tell them any of it. And that's what we want to do. That's why I'm a part of this work, to do just that. Every aspect of society is corrupt. It's politics, it's education, it's culture, even it's religions, have failed and have created a world filled with suffering. That's what these atheists say. That's what these agnostics say. All these problems in the world are because of religion. You know, they're probably right. They say they don't know who the true church of God is. They don't know who people are the true church of God. To them, Jerry Falwell is the true church, is the church of God. Billy Graham, all these they think that is God's church. They think the Catholic church is God's church. They think, think it all. They don't know that God's church is very small. church that obeys God, that wants to be a part of the work of God. They don't know anything about it. They just see the world through their eyes. They see the violence. They see the filth and the problems. They know it's because of religion. False religion. This is the world that God sees. <clears throat> and it's a 
way that was not very pleasing to me. Can you blame me? No. Many of the worlds today dismiss the prophecies of the Bible as silly or so unimportant. Ah, that's that old, that old, who cares about that old book? We've proved it over and over. It's not accurate. It's got so many errors. It contradicts itself. And nobody cares about it anyway. I've heard all this nonsense all my life. I don't want to hear it no more. Is that what did last week? Scoffers and say, I don't want to hear this no more. I heard, 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 heard. I don't want to hear about the coming of Jesus Christ. The fact is, brother, the vast majority of people that serve have no idea what the Word of God says. And that's true. They have no idea what the Word of God says. And I'll tell you how I was, I was painting the house and I said, tell this guy, I said, you know what? I said, if Billy Graham was right, I'd ask him this question. Billy Graham could not tell me the biblical definition of what a Christian is. I said, he looked at me and I said, You're, you claim you go to church, you tell me. I pointed right to this, you tell me what a Christian is. The Bible, I don't want you to hear your definition. I don't want to hear what the Bible is. He couldn't do it. And so yesterday he said, he said I was talking to him, <clears throat> excuse me, I was talking to him. He said, yeah, David, every time I say something, you say I'm wrong. You mean I come across like that? He says, yeah. Well, everybody he said was wrong. He doesn't know. But he wants to know. He just doesn't know. But the vast, vast majority of people have no idea what the word of God says. That's why they're going to be caught off, uh, off guard and, and, and surprised. The Muslim boys. With mankind's attitude about God, the Bible, and how everyone takes precaution to avoid something, their defense is not going to happen. So they're not preparing for what's coming because they're convinced it's not going to happen. They don't believe there is a God that's going to intervene. They don't believe there is a Jesus. They believe there is a good guy named Jesus Christ. They don't think he was born of a virgin because you can't be born of a virgin. That's impossible. So they think he was just a good old guy. Most of them think he's a good old guy. They just can't believe. The Jews think he's just a good guy. But they don't you know what they think about him. <clears throat> they just can't they put it in their mouths that God had to die in order for us to live. They just can't get it through their mind. This is what this world can't get through their mind. And what about you, the members of God's church? What is your attitude towards the Bible? And the prophecies dealing with the days that you and I live in. This is where I'm telling you this doesn't pertain to you. It pertains to those people. I wish this was going out on the field. Maybe she can send it to George, maybe go out. I don't know. Or I have to do it again. To those people who sit home, who know that <clears throat> this. They're going to be caught off guard. And they're going to cry like a little baby. They wish, like everything else, they'd done what they were told to do. Deal with the days that you and I live. If you're asleep, it's time to wake up, Paul says. Wake out of your sleep. It's time because the redemption draws nigh. It's much closer now than it was. Go back and read Herbert Armstrong's autobiography. Go back to the time when he was in Chicago. And to the time he talks about a dream that either he had or his wife had. You remember that? Talking about the stars she saw and had a dream about, and the an angel came down and explained to whatever it was. And the coming of Christ was getting very close. That was in 1930 or 40. So, how much more closer are we today, 60 some years later? And it's time to wake up. Are you going to be caught off guard? You become one of those people who hide, try to hide from the face of God and don't want to see this. What's coming? Second Peter, the third chapter. 2 Peter 3rd chapter verse 10. For the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise and the elements shall burnt, shall melt with firm and heat and the earth also and the works of the earth shall be burnt up. We read that and read that and to those who are faithful, loyal, and true to God's word who are fire for it, they, they take it very seriously. But for those people who are like those of you and their growth and do not want to attend service services, they just don't care what that says. This is what this is what God says to the church. In Revelation 3rd chapter, verse 3. Revelation 3rd chapter, verse 3. It says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. Received and heard what? Well, the gospel of the kingdom of God. How do you know it? How do you receive it? Then what it says, and hold fast to that. Hold fast to that and repent. Repent of what? Remember the Sabbath day if you can hold it. It is a command of sin. I don't care. Well, I don't care. I don't care if God says it's a command of sin. I'm going to stay home because the gas prices are too high. Well, it's high for me. It's high for you. 
It's time for all of us. But if you go ahead and read the 12th chapter and the 6th chapter, the 12th chapter of Luke and the 6th chapter of the man, God says, if you keep my laws, and one of them is the Sabbath, if you keep it, then I'll make sure you have the, the money and the things you need to get in the service. He's still he's talking about physical things and clothes. Nobody gives you free clothes. Nobody gives you free food. Nobody gives you a free home to live in. You have to pay for all this stuff. And God says, if you'll do this, and you'll seek the kingdom of God first, and all his, his rights and his laws, that means number four. It also means the annual holidays. If you keep these things the way I'm telling them, the instruction books here, if you do that, then I'll make sure you have all these things. A lot of people don't have enough faith. They look at that price of gas and say, man, I can't afford to do that today. So they don't, even give God, they don't even really give God a chance to bless them. If you're asleep, it's time to wake up. He says, I'm oh, sorry, back down to Revelation 13, verse 3, he says, If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know the hour which I will come upon thee. So those are the people, he says, if you don't watch, if you're not watching the wrong conditions, if you're not listening and doing the things that require you to be alert, to be awake, then I'll come up on me as a thief. And I'll catch you completely off guard. And you get to get most of your information here at services. We're going to get it. Here, here, Brother God is telling his people to be able to watch, to be aware of the conditions of this world. And how these conditions relate to what the Bible calls the last days. So if you're not here, if you're not talking amongst one another the way God wants us to do when we come before Him on the Sabbath day is to communicate with one another, that's what we should do. And some, may, some people may have more views that I don't have, and we can pass this thing on to another and tell other people what's going on in the world. And we're, uh, we're watching the world events, and we're passing this information on to one another, and we hear who, who are sick. And who needs to be prayed for? If you're not here, you can't get none of this stuff. And you're deceiving yourself. You're self deceptive. You think you've got it made. But I'm telling you, brethren, God's going to slam that door shut in your face. So I don't know you. I don't know who you are. And we're going to see that in just a minute. But all of that, God reveals the both a blessing to those who watch and consequences of failing to do so. Revelation, the 16th chapter, verse 15. Revelation 16, verse 15. <clears throat> he says, Behold, and he comes again, as it says, I come as a thief. Blessed, or supremely blessed, that's what this word blessed means. Supremely blessed, or fortunate, or well off. That's the way I feel about this. I feel because I have this knowledge, this truth that God has revealed me. I'm fortunate. I'm well off. But I'm only well off if I obey the instructions that God says I'm supposed to be doing. Not just as a minister, but just as a person of the church of God who's been called to take part in this end time work. And so you, so you and I are very fortunate to know what we know. He could have easily called somebody else and we left this out of the loop. Couldn't we? But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He that, he that watched and keepeth his garments laced, he walked naked and they see his shame. Now, have you ever seen the other old historical movies or videos of the German Jews in Nazi camps? They were naked, weren't they? They were naked. They strip them down, bare naked. This could be both physically and spiritually speaking. They could see your shame, your sins are now being in show. But they also could be physically. You notice what Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, says about this. Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. Give me a quick second. And uh, beginning of verse 47. Says the cause you do not serve the Lord your God with joy. You know, it should be joy. You know, I look forward to getting up. I don't care if there's four or five of you. I still look forward to the Sabbath. It seems like I get you before I can turn around. But getting cleaned up and coming down here to be with you, I get a great deal of pleasure out of this. But it says, uh, because you do not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart and for the abundance of everything. 
Therefore you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord sent against you in anger, in thirst, and in nakedness, and in, in the deeds of every thing. And he shall put a yoke of iron on your neck until you are destroyed. That is what you're going to get for not watching, for not obeying God's laws and keeping his, his Sabbath days away. He said, I'll strip you naked. I'll let everybody see your shame. Put your eyes turned public. That's what the armies did. I've well, always done that. Strip them down there. Complacency, complacency and an attitude of self sufficient is a precursor to this shame of the revelation the third chapter, verse 7, and find out the living sea of the earth. You can read it anytime you want to. And Jesus Christ said, I am coming again, but you don't know when. Since this is the case, it is urgent on every Christian that he, should, he or she should be in a constant state of readiness, always ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Not letting your oil die out. Not letting your lamp die out. Always being in a constant state of preparedness. Failure to do so could be catastrophic. Luke, the 12th chapter. We're getting close to the end. Luke, the 12th chapter. Notice, I'm just, I'm just sitting there reading this just long ago. I, I noticed something I hadn't seen before. Beginning in verse 35. Let your waves be curtain and your lamps burn. That means you're on fire. You're here to do the work. And yourselves be like, be like men who wait for their master when he returns from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may be open to him immediately. It sounds like Matthew 25, doesn't it? The five wise virgins, the five foolishness. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find wanting. And surely I say to you that he will gird them and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. Who? Who? Those whose lambs are on fire. Those whose hearts in the work of God. Those who have never let down. Those who, who he says, it, he finds doom. Those wise virgins who are on fire for the work of God. I'll make you come down and sit at my table and I'll serve you again in the kingdom of God. And then he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and, and find him so blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour of the deed would come, he would have watched and not allowed the house to be broken into. Therefore be ready for, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you least expect it. So at least if you come to service, you may get an idea on prophecy. You may get an update on news items and things of this nature and how close we are to the return of Jesus Christ and how close we are to the tribulation because we're always constantly got our nose in the news and looking for things to bring you. And if you're not here, you're going to miss it. You're simply going to miss it. The Bible states that the events surrounding the end of the age and the return of Christ will be a great surprise to this world and to half the church. To half the church is going to be a tremendous surprise. Unlike 9 11 that came with no warning, but the regenerate return of Jesus Christ is coming with a warning. That is our job, brethren. Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel, this is a prophecy about the soon coming kingdom of God and the events prior to it. All that entails is our job to preach to this world as a warning and as a witness. And this gospel king will preach to all the nations, and then the end will come. So they're going to have a warning. The church members have a warning. Five of them says, I don't care. I want to do what I want to do. I want to take these clean garments off and I want to go do my little thing for a while. And then when I hear the noise of the prophecy being fulfilled, the return of Jesus Christ is imminent, I want to put them back on as though I'm a righteous person and the door is slammed shut in the face. Mark, maybe you'll have to remember Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 gives a powerful description of the end time. If you're ready to read it, read it, and read it again at your own leisure. And we just can't ignore those things. We simply cannot ignore those things. Today we live in a world full of religious don't. New ones are emerging every day. The thing you must come to realize, I brought this out in the wild horse, that Jesus Christ is addressing the faith that is asserted to believe in him, not the Muslims. Not the Muslim world, not the, all the other religions of this world, the confusions of the 
I call them Confucian religions. Confucius, uh, I don't know what they all are. Voodoo, all these other, you know what they are. He's not talking about those people. He's talking about the religions that believe in him as a source of deception. And you see it on a constant daily basis. And you got to, we've got to realize this. We've got people out there, you know, I've heard years before, that take and listen to uh, John Hagee sermons as though this man knows what he's talking about. And he doesn't. He's got a little truth like all of them. But he simply doesn't know who Israel is. He doesn't know. And so they listen. They pour out they listen to his sermon. These are people who have been called with them. Listen to a false minister of Satan. I asked this guy yesterday. He said, Do you know how to tell a false minister? He said, No. No one to explain to him what Rose is. He just can't get it. But we in God's church are better get it. We better get it. How in the world can people profess Jesus Christ and be guilty of deception? That's kind of hard to believe. But he says that. He says, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And that's what they do. Jesus is the Lord. The fact of the matter is, self-professing Christians believe they have the right to decide for themselves how they can worship the Son of God. And that is exactly true. I'm not stating fact. I'm stating fact. And you know, if you're Sunday morning back, you look at it. Pick the choice of the church of your choice. And they're all different. And they all got the same book. It's incredible. Brethren, the great God has called you and me out of this world of religious confusion and given us a glimpse into the most magnificent kingdom that's come to this earth. We've got a glimpse of it, don't we? A kingdom that we rule by mercy and judgment and faith. It is a kingdom that will produce peace, great peace, health, prosperity, and great hope for all human beings. No more of you that live on television and see these little children around the world dying of starvation and flies all over the feet, over the face and feet, and little match stick legs, mothers dying. People have been killed because of the false religion, because they don't believe in the Muslim religion, they've been killed. And on and on it goes. It's no more that's going to take place. It's going to allow, God's going to allow it to happen. He's going to put a stop to it. All that foolishness, He's going to put a stop to it. Through this great kingdom that's come to this earth, and you and I have, been, have the privilege to know what's coming. He's given us a glimpse into the future. And that's what we'll be a part of. That's why we're here. God wants his servants to proclaim the good news of that kingdom. That's what we want to do. We want people to know what we know. And let them do with it what they want, but at least give them a chance to know what kind of what's coming to this earth and who Jesus Christ really is. Not the false one that is preached every Sunday. Not him. Not that. But he wants us to give that good news. That's why you're called. That's why you're to be a part of that work and to follow his instructions written in the Bible. The return of Jesus Christ is real. And it's coming. It's coming with a warning. And to the end, he's directed this service. You and I, he says, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their sins. That includes you. You're the servant of God. I'm the servant of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And spare not. Don't spare one word of it. Don't leave something out and add something to it. You know, that's, you can't do that. When speaking about the fight against the Soviet Union, listen to this. This pertains to us. When President Reagan was alive, and he talked about the Soviet Union, this is what he said about communism. He said this, if not us, who? And if not now, when? And this statement is just easily applied to God's church. If not us, who? And if not now, when? When are we going to do it? And who's going to do it if we don't do it? The Church of God. Members of the Church of God, rabbis, or whoever they are. If we don't do this, we don't lift up our voice now, when are we going to do it? So what can we learn from the 9-11 that walked our nations? In one moment, there was a moment, there was peace. In the next second, there was destruction and death. Was it? Brethren, is it possible that the events of 9-11 was to wake us up, especially God's people. Of those who are instructed to watch world events, is that the reason you think it's not only one of the reasons you allowed that to happen? To wake the church up? It says the entire church slumbered and slept. God's church knows what lies ahead for the descendants of God. 
I'm sorry, of Joseph. They know the meaning of Jacob's trouble. This gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed as a witness that calls God's great and merciful and wants with all his heart to heal and to forgive. He said, I, I, I have no pleasure in death of the wicked. They all should come to repentance. And I can heal them all because they're all mine. Black, yellow, and red, and pink, whatever color they are, we're all belong to God. And he created this for a very specific purpose. And whether the nations is heard, listen or not, the gospel still must be proclaimed. Now look at what Paul said in closing. Turn to Acts 13, chapter. I didn't know this was even in you. God, I did, but I got all about it. Acts, the 13th chapter. Beginning verse 4. He said, be, Beware, therefore, at least that what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Now, what has been spoken in the prophets? I just read it somewhere. I only just gave you a glimpse of what the prophet said is coming. Behold, you, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days. A work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. Now, this is what the new NIV says. It kind of gives it a more plain. It says, Look, you scoffers, wander, and wanderers, and perish, for I am for I'm going to do something in your days that will, you will never believe, even if someone told you. God's end time church is that someone that Paul is talking about. Do you want to be a part of it? Of this end time, or are you just satisfied sitting home complaining that the gas prices are too high? Whatever it is, and I'm not talking about people who are sick, who want to come, have no way of getting to services. I'm not talking about those people. Because I, I, it's just God bless those people who want to be here and can't. I'm talking about people who can come to service, not just here. This happens to all the groups which are God's church around the world. All of them do the very same thing. Those people be here and do not want to be here. Or use every excuse in the world not to come here. They're carnal. They're as carnal as the day they were born. Because they would want to be among you with the doctor. They want to be a people of like mind. But instead, they want to sit home and make excuses why they can't be here. And we're that someone. The church of God is that someone in these end time days that is going to do something that people are simply not going to believe. You can read about that. I think in the last part of the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel, going on to the 12th chapter. These people do dirty exploits. So you can't sit home and just watch a sermon and think you've done God's service. You've kept the Sabbath. You can't do it. You can't be a part of it. You're just fooling yourselves and you're just sound asleep. And the return of Jesus Christ is getting closer and you will not wake up in time. People simply are not going to wake up in time. If you're one of the five foolish versions and the door slams shut in your face, you will never be able to say, it came without a way. You will have no excuse whatsoever. Upon the return of Jesus Christ, and the door slams shut in your face because you refuse to follow the instructions. 